Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, we've met together, we've met in you. We just recognise we've been in the presence of the living God. And we make it sound like it's something that uh, is a rare occurrence, but it's an everyday occurrence. And Lord, as we look at your word, as we seek your will together, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will all be changed and transformed. Amen. Amen. Well, just about good morning. Um, you do realise that Murray's in the final at Queen's today, don't you, Andy? Just want to mention it. <laughs> Listen, this is my absolute dream. This is tennis month. So, uh, yeah. It's going to be interesting. I'm uh, next week. I'm I'm both. Uh, oh, look, we're back to that again. I'm both. Oh, maybe God's trying to tell us something. Freedom. Um, Next week, I'm both leading the service and speaking. I warn you now, the two may not necessarily go quite in that order or even that separated. Just thought I'd mention that now. Um, I'm not going with the men, um, so I'm going to be here and we'll take it as it comes. But um, I just thought I'd mention that now in passing, so you can all be prepared for next week to walk in and find it not normal. Mind you, what is normal at Greenford Baptist Church these days, yes? Um, I, if you're able to, can you, um, the laptop's almost fully loaded with all the right stuff to us to start displaying the Bible up on the screen. Uh, but um, I today want us to look at, uh, in Mark, chapter 6. Uh, verses 31 to 44. And what is normally subtitled in the, uh, in the unhelpfully in Bibles, the feeding, Jesus feeds 5,000. Because he actually feeds more than 5,000, but he doesn't actually do it. So it's an interesting concept and we'll work that through as we go along. So it's Mark chapter 6. Who's got Mark chapter 6? Who's got their phones out? Who's going for good old-fashioned paper? Both work incredibly well. I still believe in using proper diaries. They don't crash. You don't lose your data. But Mark chapter 6. So just to give you a clue what's happened so far up until today. We're not carrying on with the whole of Mark teaching. I'm just recapping here particularly, that um, Jesus sent out the 12, if you remember, to go and deal with the demon possessed, to heal the sick, and they came back going, oh my gosh, it worked. Think probably quite do it in those tones, but it's along those sort of lines. And let's be honest, that's what tends to happen to us if we suddenly hear it. How many heard those two stories of healing today and went, goodness me, it works. It happens today. We also have in here, Mark, and we didn't look at it particularly, is actually the banquet of Herod. And this is where John the Baptist has his head. Uh, 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 he was beheaded. Um, and therefore then you have that image in there. And it's very what one would consider a very selfish banquet. The banquet that Herod held was a very selfish one. Because the idea was all about pomp and all about him and him looking good. And he actually looked worse in the end. But it was all about that. So we actually now flow in from Mark into another kind of banquet story that is not actually self-centred. Do you get the, how Mark has written that? I think it's very good. So verse 30 literally states, The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. 
So the disciples have come back, wow, probably excited, but probably exhausted, I would suggest. Has anyone ever gone on a ministry tour, ever spent a whole day engaged in ministry? There was uh, the worship team were all out all day yesterday at uh, another Baptist church, 9 till 5.30, a last chunk of them. Uh, and it was an incredibly good day, was it not? But it was also incredibly tiring afterwards because there was a lot of engagement and focus. And, uh, you know, when God uses you quite powerfully, you can come away feeling tired and exhausted physically, let alone emotionally and spiritually, and you need period. So here we have now Jesus then saying to them after they've said, we've done and this and taught this. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't he even have time to eat. But I love this. For me, this is really something that's quite something. Jesus telling his disciples, come off, let's go somewhere, some quiet time together. Come on, let's go. Let's just chill out together. Yeah? No fervent prayer. No Bible reading. No, sitting there, me teaching you this, 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 and this next. None of that. It's just, come on, let's go off and have lunch. Let's do lunch. Have you ever considered that with Jesus? Jesus turning around to you, come on, let's go do lunch together. Does that feel weird, the concept of our Lord Jesus Christ saying, come spend some time with me. Let's just... Be in each other's presence. Doing nothing else. Chit-chatting maybe. Resting. Do you want to doze off? Ah, doze off, it's fine. You need the rest. Do, do you get the point? I have this great thing that happens to me at times. Very rare. It's rare this happens, okay? Hear me carefully. Before you think your pastor does this every day of every week. You'd be lucky if it's once or twice a year. But the odd occasion, I might grab a book... Go and sit in a pub, sit with a pint, with an empty chair opposite me, and sort of imagine Jesus is there as well. And I'm just reading, chatting to him, as I'm reading in a casual manner. Taking time out, resting. Do you get the imagery? Now, I don't talk overly loud or openly, on the crowns of fact, I would look a little bit... Um, maybe I've had one too many. But the point is, I think we don't allow ourselves time just to be with God. Just to chill out with him. Do you know what I mean by chill out? I know it's an old term these days, but just to relax. Not to be fervently saying, I must study the scriptures. Let's be honest, how often do we really go, let's study the scriptures. But, you know, I must fervently seek him in prayer now. I must be on my bended knee, agonising over something or asking for forgiveness for something. or doing this, this, this and this. And actually, just come and be in my presence. Do nothing else. Come and just have a laugh. And we see it here. Yes, they had the human Jesus. They had the, the man, Jesus, that they could go and do that. But it was, come off, let's go off and rest. Does that sound alien to anybody here? Be honest. Does it feel disrespectful almost? Why would it be? Why would it be? I like the fact there was for here Jesus a real practicality. You need to do this. 
We don't have to frantically be agonising. We should be doing something for God. We actually sometimes need to maybe agonise the fact we just need to be with him. Do you see what I mean? The reverse. We don't agonise over it, but actually just rest in his presence. Allow him to talk and minister and refresh you and all of that without having to seek it. Just go, hey, I'm in your presence. Let's just chat. Cup of tea? Coffee? Just sitting here on the sofa in an armchair, just chatting. You can do that. It is allowed. And I think Jesus will then minister to us quite heavily. Tell us about who he thinks we are. About ourselves. I think this was great. I think, you know, we sometimes think we must constantly be burning ourselves out. And it's like, no. It's the last thing you do. So, they go off. They left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. Do you know what? They didn't have mobile phones. And if they did, they would have learned to turn them off. I almost got this image of Jesus with a bucket going, go on, stick your mobile phone in that. <laughs> Let's go. But come on, a quiet place. Sometimes that's it. We have to turn the phones off. Unplug it from the landline. <gasps> Be incommunicado from the rest of the world. You can live. It's okay. It's not going to kill you. Actually, not taking rest and time out might well stress you out. It might well kill you. I do love it when you get some people say, I've been trying to get hold of you. Yeah, and? Well, you've not answered. Well, I've got a right not to, you know. I might have been doing something else. I'm not talking about the office, but I'm just talking generally. I've heard it people in the past. I've been texting, I've been, you know, my old... And you just think, it's okay, loud, to just be with God and shut the rest of the world out. Anyway, so they get on their boat. Many people recognised them and saw them leaving. Oh dear. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. That's why you don't use a boat, you use a car. You can move faster. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them. Because they were all like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Imagination time. You're on the boat. You're the disciples. You've been rowing your boat. Oh, Going to have some chill out time with Jesus now. This is great. Going to get some food. I absolutely just want to go asleep. That's what I want to do. And as you're approaching the shoreline, you see the crowd of people. And you saw them earlier running and you're thinking, what, what, what? No, 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 don't you dare. Don't, yeah? Living in the real world? Yeah? How many times you got, no. Or your phone rings. And you're like, oh, really? You're calling me now? Oh, what do you want? Am I being honest? Am I being real? Is that what happens with you? So imagine the disciples going, oh, please, I just wanted to rest. And Jesus goes, I have compassion on them. Now, this is what I'm going to start with you. What do you think that word compassion actually means? What do you think it means? Do you think Jesus went, oh, oh, let me love you. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. That sort of compassion? That sort of, 
Oh, oh, bless you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let, 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 me, let me, come on, let me spend some time with you. It's okay. You can yawn away. It's all right. It's fine. <laughs> Do you think there's that sort of, oh, are you okay? Think that sort of compassion? And most of us, when we read that, and I'll be honest, when I used to read that, that's what I thought it used to mean. But it doesn't. Because we see it and we say, oh, it looks like they're sheep without a shepherd. Oh, yes, again, it gives this nice imagery. Mainly because we see in children's book this lovely imagery of Jesus cuddling a white fluffy sheep. And being all nice to the sheep. And maybe almost patting its head. But he also began teaching them many things. And you have to take the whole lot in one sort of lump and go, what does that mean? He had compassion on them, saw that they're sheep without a shepherd, which actually, by the way, is the imagery that's used within uh, Jewish writing of Israel without a leader, a military type leader, a David leader, a King David leader. That's what it actually means. And in teaching them many things, notice that, he was teaching them. He wasn't going, oh, there, 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 let me pat your hand and make you all feel better. He was instructing them. What does that all mean? That whole connotation, that word compassion is actually based around, about, sort of almost recognising they need a focused leader that they can follow in almost like a military type imagery. Do you see the point? It is not compassion. There, 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 I'll pastorally, I'll counsel you and make you feel better. It's actually, you need someone to follow. You're like headless sheep. Or headless chicken is the normal phrase. But you are sheep who are wandering. You want to do something, but you don't know what it is you want to do. And you need somebody to tell you what to do and to guide you. It's that imagery. So next time you read this, don't be sitting there thinking, oh, Jesus must have just smiled nicely at them. While the disciples are going, oh, really? Come on, I want to rest. It's not that. Jesus saw them. Why? Well, this land that they're in within Galilee, etc., actually normally the whole raft of zealots were there. The zealots were zealoty. They were zealous and had lots of zeal to do a very much revolutionary uprising. Wanting to cause trouble. Wanting to throw out the Romans in a very uh, 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 violent, militaristic manner. And that's what's here. That's the land that they're in. And they're without a leader. They obviously want to cause a bit of a revolution. Yeah? Power to the people. That sort of thing. Kick out the Romans, they shouldn't be in our land. Do it, you know, don't wait for Yahweh, let's do it ourselves. That sort of imagery. And they're probably waiting for a leader to rah, take them on and take out the Romans. And we know that with Jesus. We know that they really mis the disciples misunderstood him. They thought he was going to overthrow the Romans with arms. Not these, but, you know, weapons. Yeah? But actually, that wasn't the case. And here, this teaching is actually Jesus gripping them and grabbing hold of them and saying, no, I am actually going to teach you how you overthrow them, not the way that you're thinking. Do you see the point? So don't think, when you read that next time, that Jesus went, ah. Oh. I really do hate this image we have of our Lord Jesus, like some half beautiful, blonde, blue, blonde hair, blue eyes. Really? So that's what you've got here. That sort of, I can see you lot need to follow someone. You need a leader. You are lost. You've obviously got a lot of energy. You've got a lot of wanting to do this. You've got a lot of wanting to work out something. But actually, you've got no vision, no focus. You don't know what. With me? So, late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Make you laugh, doesn't it? Just, 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 Jesus, 
don't know if you noticed, don't know if you're aware, we're in a very deserty, remote place. Imagine Jesus going, oh, I hadn't noticed. Oh, thanks for pointing that out. And it's getting late. No, really? I can't see it getting darker. Anyway. Well, why were they doing that? I mean, let's imagine for a minute. Could you imagine? Why did they do that? Let's just, 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 just imagine. Come on, chuck out some imaginations. Why do you think? And think beyond the text. Why do you think they wanted to say? I think they were impatient. They wanted Jesus to finish so they could go home. Yep. Impatient. Wanted Jesus to finish so they go home. Anybody else? I know you said think outside the text, but it does say that they had to leave without even eating. So by now they were probably famished, probably getting hypoglycemic and very ratty. Yes. Thank you for the very medical technical term. So I think people like talking into my chest. That's why. No. no okay. Thanks. Cool. Um, because Jesus promised them rest, a time with him, and nothing else. So they're trying to remind him, what about the promise you've given us? Let's go and do that. It's getting late. When are we going to have the time to, to actually chill? Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Look, you don't have to talk into my chest now. It's okay. Okay. Yeah, I think partly that was... <laughs> Please. And then his teacher, oh, come on. That's not how the day was meant to go. You said... It's like a little child almost, isn't it? You said that what we were going to do was go and have some fun. And then can you imagine as a parent, listen, ain't my fault something's gone awry, all right? The car broke down or whatever. No, the day's gone different. And how much does our whole day not go the way we thought it would go? Come on, how many times has your day not gone the way you thought it would go? Loads of times, yeah? And I bet you deal with it graciously, easily, like I do, with no sense of irritation or annoyance or stomping off your feet. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I can imagine these good old normal disciples were like, oh, just, where's the grub? McDonald's is going to shut in a minute. I can imagine they just wanted to rest and that's it. So, send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. Get rid of them, Jesus. I've had enough. I want to rest. Yeah? Oh, get off the phone, come on. And you could imagine right now them thinking, and Jesus is going to say, absolutely right. Very practical chaps. Well, send them off. It's all right, Jesus is not British toff, but you're with the image you're here. I can imagine that's they're going to, this sounds a very plausible thing. We've clearly got no food in the camp. Send them off. And that's what you're expecting the response. <laughs> when are we ever going to learn? Jesus never does what we think he should do. Yeah? Then Jesus said, you feed them. Imagine your response at that moment. You are aware there is no food in the camp. Okay? You've got 5,000 men at least, we know. Plus the families. Plus the women and the children, yeah? It's never just 5,000. In the Bible, when it says he fed 5,000 uh, men, it actually is, in this particular case, just 5,000 men, but, the word being used, but it's recognised there would have been women and children there as well, because they're not counted. In society, they're not... Sorry, women, but you weren't important. Male chauvinism kicked in. So you didn't say anything then, did you? That's what I thought. 
But imagine that many people, and you know you haven't got anywhere near that sort of food in you. Yeah? You haven't been to Costco. You haven't got it in bulk. It's stuffed. And so then Jesus to turn around and say, you feed them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Credit cards maxed out, Jesus. Uh, 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 cash, anybody? What have you got in your wallet? Well, if you open mine, it's normally moths. Well, that's the trick. What's in the other pockets? Another matter altogether. But, um, you know, you sit there and you say, but I've got no money. And there's not enough here. And we've got to... <laughs> We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. We equal to about, probably in reality, about a year's worth of money they needed to earn to feed everyone. Yeah? So you can imagine their reaction. Would you be like that if Jesus suddenly said, well, you feed them. You do it. How much bread do you have, Jesus said? Go and find out. In other words, Jesus is saying, go and find out amongst you what resources you already have. What amongst you, what resources do you already have? You're looking at what you haven't got. I'm looking at what you have got they come back and reported we have five loaves of bread and two fish it's not a lot is it then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups and on the green grass so they sat down in groups of 50 or a hundred Jesus took the five loaves and two fish looked up towards heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed from those loaves. For me, it's not the feeding of the 5,000 plus. It's not the miracle of how did that bread and fish just keep going? I mean, I've always sat there trying to imagine it, you know, he just broke the bread. And then was it that every time it was all like, I won't say magic trick, but you know what I mean? All of a sudden, then the, the loaf just kept growing. Reminds me of the uh, Elijah and the widow story of the oil that just kept replenishing itself. The image here, by the way, that's being used in the New Testament is uh, parallel with what happened with Moses when the people said, where's our food? And every day, manna just kept coming from heaven. It's that same imagery that's being used. The fact they split up into groups of 50 and 100 is, again, the same imagery we get within Moses dividing up the tribes of Israel into a particular section so they could be looked after and fed. So there's lots of parallels there deliberately. As I said to you, back to that compassion, that leader that is required is a Moses stroke King David type leader that they're trying to portray here, which Jesus is. And it's that same imagery. Always with the Bible, look below the text, deeper into the text, wider into it, and you see so much more there. But it's not that. What gets me is two things. Go off... And see what resources you already have. Let's start there first. And then I, God, can multiply that resource. It's not always about food here. It's about the resources that God says that you have got. Watch what I can do with that. I'll come to that in a moment. But this other thing for me is, is actually, who distributed the bread? 
and the fish. In the story, who actually distributed it out? Who actually handed it out? The disciples, the apostles, they handed out the bread and the fish, didn't they? Jesus didn't go, and... Did he? Could you imagine that whole imagery? Jesus running around, 5,000 plus people. No, he used the disciples. He used the church. He used who? Church. He used who? He uses... He uses us to minister to others, his grace. He also uses us to minister leadership. Who's meant to take the lead, do you think, in our world? In guiding people and seeing them and giving them purpose and focus. His church, his brothers and sisters around the world, his body around the world, us. Just, just think about that just for a minute. We're now classed as his body, yes? He's the head of the church, his body. So if he saw and had compassion on people in a leadership type way, he focused them and gave them teaching and training in what they should do and how their purpose should be fulfilled, what they should be doing with their lives. That is actually now the role of also us, the church, worldwide. I'm not just talking Greenford Baptist Church, but let's just focus on us for a minute. We're not unique. We're not the only uh, God-following, Jesus-following church around the world, I'm glad to say. It'd be a real sad state of affairs if we were. But let's take hold of that. It is actually our role as church to lead, to teach, in the way that Jesus did there. He taught, had compassion, taught, and also supplied needs. Yeah? And here it's just sort of a, well, no, actually, you can't say that. We so focus on the 5,000 being fed physically that what we miss is, is actually his teaching also spiritually fed them. We actually miss the two things. We so focus on the great miracle of the loaves and the fish and still want to know how that happened. What did that look like? It's one of my key things. If I ever had a time machine, if I ever had the TARDIS, plonk me there. I want to see how that worked. What did that physically look like? But it's down to the church both to feed in that way, but feed spiritually as well. To teach, to give, to show. And then we come back to this point for me, is that this, this sense of, but it's only us, it's only little old me, or it's only us little Greenford Baptist Church. Yeah? you might think about that I come back for me I don't know about you but sometimes I, I look around and I could be sitting in my car watching the world go by watching traffic and I just think all these people just look down a road and look at all the houses and look at all the people that live in them and realize they are sheep without a shepherd they are lost and you look and you say it's overwhelming it can't be done. Do, do, do you think like that? Do you do that at all occasionally? I do that. I, I, what can we do? It's just little us. It's just little me. It's just... But actually, God says, don't look at what you haven't got. Look at what you have got. And I multiply it through you distributing it out. 
You talk about me, it will multiply. You teach people about me, it will multiply. Let's take those, that, uh, those two uh, uh, testimonies today of people that were healed. You talk about that to ten other people, they will talk about that to ten other people. That's sort of a simple way of it multiplies. Don't look at what you haven't got. Look at what you have got. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honour at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. What are we lacking? I read that. What are we lacking? What are we lacking? We're lacking nothing from Christ. Where we're lacking is probably our use of it. Where we're lacking is our belief that it's actually physically here. I can imagine the disciples. You've got to be joking. No, no, that can't happen. That's just not possible. So I can imagine it's nicely scripted and nicely compact there in Mark, because Mark's very much about, dum, 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 get on with the story. Yeah? But I can imagine there was this, what you are ki- No, did you hear what he just said? Nah, he's having a laugh, isn't he? Look how many people there are. It can't be done. No, ridiculous idea. I bet they weren't very polite about Jesus. Don't, don't live under some illusion that they were all, yes, Lord. Ah, whatever you say, every word and command that comes out of my mouth, I will obey with no argument. Do you do that? No. No. So what do you think they're going to do? And this was pre-death and resurrection. They still didn't understand who he was. We lack nothing together as a body. Nothing. Nothing. We focus half the time on what we don't have. We should be focusing on what we do have, which is everything. Do you believe that? Seriously, honestly, don't say yes. Don't just say yes for the sake of it because we're in a sermon. It's like that version where preachers go, amen, and everybody shouts, amen, back. And actually, you haven't really heard what you're saying, amen, too. You're just saying, amen. Preacher just said, what you said is, could you buy me a Mercedes Benz? And the whole church went, amen. (laughs) I wouldn't want a Mercedes Benz. Nothing against Mercedes. But don't just say yes to that. Do you believe that you actually have everything we need in this body to actually teach, lead, act 
activate God's kingdom on this earth, to, to walk the streets, to walk our people, our friends, our family, and say, Christ is here. Because when I read the Bible, it says we have. But we're like the disciples that went, oh, only got five loaves and two fish. That's all we got. That's all you think you've got. What you've actually got is this. Now my arms can't stretch wide enough. That's what we've got. To get excited. Who believed any real healing would have happened last week? Let's be honest. It's been a real leap forward. And I've been reading about this and you have to keep believing. That's why you have to keep giving testimonies about it when it's happening. Whether you're scared to come up the front or not. Because it encourages everyone. And each time you encourage people, you're going to go, wow. I wonder if the disciples, after feeding all that lot and distributing all the food out, went... And they probably sat in silence eating there going... Did you just see what just happened? As they're distributing it out, I can imagine they're going, no, you're having a laugh. It's going to run out, surely. And everybody, by the way, who ate was fully satisfied. Nobody lacked a thing at the end. Nobody walked out with grumbling stomachs. And I believe also that fully satisfied wasn't just in the sense of being fed physically, they were also fed spiritually and they were satisfied because they started learning about what their purpose is. They had found a leader that they knew they needed to follow. You're grasping that. Anybody getting excited slightly? One, thanks. Two, thank you. We lack nothing, my brothers and sisters. Where the lacking occurs is up here. Where the lacking occurs is up here. I, we, the leadership team, we've for some time now believed very much that, that um, Greenford is a place to be known visually, <laughs> it's to be visible, not invisible. Um, the trees coming down are just a physical statement, I think, of the, the visibility. But God wants to pour, wants to use us, must rephrase that, use us more in the supernatural, what we class as supernatural. And actually, that doesn't help neither. Do you know, when you say that, it starts putting all the doubts in your mind, saying, this is bigger than, oh dear, oh no, not me. We can do the natural thing. Let's do food banks. Let's, 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 let's cuddle people. Let's, they are there. But the other movement in actually seeing dynamic stuff, what we consider dynamic stuff happen, which actually to God is just, well, the natural because he's given you it. And he's given it to the church. If you're here this morning, could you do this? If you're here this morning, can you do this? If you follow Jesus and you do this, yeah? Guess what? You're the church. <laughs> not me. No, it's I didn't actually pray for anybody yes, uh, last Sunday. Or well, not on a personal level. It was noted, wasn't it? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm trying to cop out of it. It's, it's do as I teach, not as I do. No, it's not. It's just that, that Sunday I felt it was very important that we as a church start grasping. It's us together. You know when Jesus says, you will do even more than what I've done? That's because we are many. He was... 
He says, you'll do greater things than I will do. He's probably also talking about greater miracles, but he's talking, you'll do it greater because you are more than one. And it's here, my brothers and sisters. It's more than bubbling, it's here. But we, we, note the phrase we, have got to grasp that reality up here. We come in, not just at church on a Sunday morning, but we go out there to church every other day of the week, expectant it's going to happen. The streets are flowing with God's spirit. We just need to engage with him there and be the ones that are distributing it out in basketfuls as he uses us. Could you imagine yourself right now doing that? Get your imagination going for a minute. Just imagine for a minute, you're talking to a neighbour, walking down the street, talking to a work colleague, your, your, your normal life. And it's, by the way, it's their normal life and they're chasing you down. You're trying to get some rest and they're like, going to interrupt you. But you're there in your workplace and all of a sudden somebody says, can you pray for me? Or could you pray for a family member? Or I've seen something in you that makes me want to follow Jesus. Can you lead me to him right now? I'm just making coffee before I go back to my desk. Can you see me later? I can imagine that would happen to some of us. But just imagine that for a minute. Because God says, no, do it now. You don't need a church meeting. You don't need worship music in the background. We can do that because God has given it all to us. For his glory, for his purpose. Did you notice last week, we did no pomp and ceremony. There was no, I'm going to stick on cool, groovy, background worship music. I'm going to all ask you to stand, and would you like to all come over here? Did you, did you notice that? It was just, if you want healing, get up and go over here. Still don't know why it was over here, but anyway. Do you remember that? I'd like us all to stand, if you're able to, please. If you're honest with yourself, you've resonated with chunks of those disciples, those chunks of no, not me, that can't be possible. No, not us. I'm not this, I'm not that. I'm not, yeah? If, be honest, that's, If you've resonated that bit this morning, I want you now just not to come forward and, and respond. We're not doing that this morning. I think that's inappropriate. But I want you to respond right now to God standing. Say, Lord, change my mindset. Change the way I think.
Well, I say, Lord, I know because of what you supplied, note the past tense, what you've supplied, we can feed the 5,000. If you want to hold your hands out to receive that mindset, put your hands on your head. Nobody else is looking at you, it's only me. And I'm not going to judge you. Actually say, yeah, I change my mindset, change the way I think. Lord, I want to pray for everyone here. So we're almost doing lunch with you right now. Our mindset is being changed about who who we are and what you have supplied already. Let none of us walk out of here today, Lord. Almost reverting back to five loaves and two fish in our thinking. Reverting back to, what are you talking about? No, not us, we don't have that, I don't have that. Lord, help us to be people to recognize the glorious riches that you have fulfilled your church, us, with, for your glory and for your purpose. And help us to be people to, as we have freely received, to freely dish out in baskets and bucket loads. For your name, for your glory, not for us, not for the name of Greenford Baptist Church, but for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be leaders who change your streets, your homes, your people. We become people that they actually want to be part of. Change our mindset right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.